we met Elvis in Memphis. We were working with Eddie Arnold in those days. And we had just finished doing a film series with Eddie Arnold called Eddie Arnold Time. And so we, were, we went to various cities to promote it, and we went to Memphis. And Elvis had been hearing us sing on the Grand Ole Opry. And occasionally on the Grand Ole Opry, we'd sing a spiritual. Now, we didn't sing spirituals all the time, but occasionally we'd, we'd sing a dig a little deeper or something like that, you know, some spiritual. And that is what he absolutely loved. And so when we played the Ellis Auditorium in Memphis with Eddie, and this was in 1955, he came back behind stage to meet us, not to meet Eddie Arnold. <laughs> he wanted to sing with us. And uh, <clears throat> he told me, uh, he, he told the group, he said, if I ever got a major recording contract, I want you guys to work with me. But we didn't think a thing about it. We were, we were told that quite often, and we didn't think a thing about it at all. But when RCA signed him in January of 1956, he asked for us, and that was a relationship we had for almost 15 years. Well, the first live show we did, we did with him was three days at that beautiful theater in, in, <laughs> in Atlanta, that big theater in Atlanta. And he told me, he said, now, if this is a, a, a success, I want you guys to do all my personal appearances with me from now on. And so what a, what a, what a wonderful joy that was to do that three days in Atlanta with him because every show was sold out. And uh, that was the first show that we did with him. And every show, of course, we did with him thereafter was sold out, too. I think Love Me Tender is the greatest, really the greatest, the prettiest song, love song, that, El that Elvis actually recorded. I just absolutely love that song. I, I never get tired of hearing it. Rich Richard Egan and Deborah Padgett was the star of the movie. Elvis was not even written in that movie until it, it, it had been, if you watch the movie, you see the first 30 minutes, you won't even see Elvis because they wrote Elvis into that movie after it had long started for Hal Wallace and, and Hollywood with the Paramount Theater, but uh, I mean Paramount Studios. But uh, Richard Egan at uh, at first was <laughs> didn't didn't fact didn't like the fact that Elvis Elvis was going to be the star in that movie because he was supposed to be the star in the movie, and at first he wasn't nice to to Elvis at all. But Elvis was such a nice guy he just he just he couldn't refuse. He <laughs> he had to he had to accept him whether or not he wanted to. But he really found out that Elvis was really a great guy. So they got along beautifully in in the show after it started. <laughs> the audiences were always wild. I don't care. He could just do this, and they'd scream and holler. It's just you'd think it was planted, but it wasn't. It's that's just where the audience were. They just absolutely worshipped this guy. They loved everything he did, as they still do. It's amazing how, how the audience absolutely loved Elvis because he had such a beautiful smile and such a sincere look on his face. Everybody knew, knew he was very sincere about what he did. <laughs> Women in particular. <laughs> well, it's like my wife said when he walked on the stage in Vegas, he's the best looking human being. She said he's the prettiest human being I've ever seen. And that's pretty much the way the women feel about him. And and I and, and I and the men do too, because some men resent the fact he's so good looking. But who who could who could deny that he is good looking? Jerry Lee and Stola were in. Uh, they they came to radio recorders in Hollywood to promote and push whatever song they were promoting. You know that they were that they had written for Elvis, and the fact that they were there uh, made Elvis enjoy or want to do what they, because they were such nice guys, and they, they sat down at the piano and played and sung whatever song they'd, they, they'd written for him. And uh, it, 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 it was good, very good. And uh, Elvis, was, Elvis loved their, their music and loved their songs. And the, the, colonel, the colonel wanted them to come and be there as much as they could, and they were. When they were starting a the movie, they, they, Elvis would say, now, if you guys can stay with me, well, we'll all work together in the movie. He said we did the soundtracks for all of them, but we appeared in some of them if we had the time. <laughs> and in Love and You, we appeared, at the, we appeared in several of the crowd scenes. Uh, and, but at the end of the movie, we did a big finale song with him, you know, where he went, came out and we, we were on stage and, you know, we, we, we sang to him and threw our arms down and all that at the end of the movie. 
And uh, that movie was the first movie I think that his his mother and dad appeared in. They, they were they were there in the audience. Can I Fall in Love was a, a that was my favorite of all the songs we did with Elvis. We did that in Blue Hawaii. That was where we when we recorded it because it was used in that movie. So, uh, and, and on that particular song, he told us a lot about meeting Priscilla and knowing Priscilla and getting acquainted with Priscilla. So that's just, that song is kind of special to the Jordanaires because he told us about how much he thought of Priscilla and what she meant to him and what she'd meant to his life. And, you know, that just, the two just connected really great. I'll always treasure that. Studio, Studio B here in Nashville was actually Elvis's favorite place to record. We did a lot of recordings in different places, as you know. But Studio B here in Nashville, and I'm so glad it's still just exactly like it was when Elvis loved to record. That piano is the same piano that Elvis loved to play. And uh, it, it's just always very special that we were able to keep that studio. And, and uh, I, my thanks to Mike Kerr for allowing us to keep that studio. <laughs> Elvis had more soul and more love for, for his friends and his fans than, than anyone that I've ever known. He loved, uh, he loved the Jordanaires and the people that were around him in the studio, Mitty Kirkham, who sang the high part. He loved because we were family to him. He didn't have brothers and sisters. We were the, we didn't, you know, so that made a big difference. We were the closest thing to a family to him, and that's the reason he loved all of us. It's just something that, that will be always very special to me. Well, being on stage with Elvis, and then you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that I could tell you that would be like being in front of an audience of 25 or 30,000 people screaming and hollering. Most of the time, like he said, screaming and hollering so much that those, those people can't hear a word I'm saying. He'd say to us, one time he said, I bet if, if, I, threw, if I threw my coat out there, they'd tear it to threads, and they did. He, I think it was in Hawaii. I think it was 50,000 in Hawaii that we had or something like that, some huge 35 or 40,000 people. And uh, he threw his, he picked his, pulled, pulled his coat off and threw it out in the audience and they tore that coat, to, it was like throwing a, a pound of meat out to a bunch of hungry dogs. They tore that coat to threads. And it's just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really a sight that I shall never forget. Really, to tell you the truth, Elvis was scared a lot of times. He would work as close to us and to the musicians as he could possibly work because he never knew. I know in, I think it was in Kansas City they broke through the police lines and, and, and ran toward the stage to us. And, and Elvis turned around to the Jordanaires and said, run for, you know, run for your life, and, and we did. And we hit the car door just about the time the crowd got there. It, it, was, uh, it was really, that's the only time that I can remember of all the stage shows we did with him that the audience broke through the crowds. Now, in, in Canada, in, in one of the places, they threw eggs at us. And one egg hit Scotty's guitar, the neck of his guitar, and, and Scotty did this, and Elvis turned around and made him mad. And Elvis was not a person to get mad. He just didn't, it just wasn't his nature to get mad and, and, and tell people off or holler at her or anything like that. Maybe he'd have been better off, maybe he'd have still been here if he had have, had have done that, but he didn't. But this, this didn't make him mad. He turned to us and you could see the fire in his eyes and he said, one more egg and we'll walk off this stage and we won't sing another song. And there wasn't another egg. Well, the Jordanaires have all been, always been so lucky to, to do the recordings here in Nashville. For 23 years, we did from two to four sessions a day. Now, I know you wonder how in the world could we hold up. Each one of us have substitutes, and if, <laughs> and if our voice is in bad shape like, like, like mine is today, I'd call my substitute in and work. But we worked with all the, the, the country stars here in Nashville. We did all Patsy Klein's, all Loretta Lynn's, you name them, we did it. And, uh, uh, and, and we're still doing background, but we don't want to do like we used to do, four sessions a day. <laughs> but for 23 years, we did from two to four sessions a day. So while Elvis was in the service, <clears throat> we heard from him periodically, of course, while he was in the service. But we didn't really know, and he didn't really know, if the audience was going to accept him. 
But I'll have to give the colonel credit for that. The colonel kept his name out front and kept his his uh, the desire for you to for him to come back and record before and with with the public. And I'll have to give the colonel that credit. He did he did keep his name before the public, and when he got out of the service, well, here he was, and of course we we hit the studios almost immediately and, and put out some songs, and that's that's what 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 he did, but at this but Elvis didn't know that was going to happen. You know, he didn't it, he didn't know how the audience would accept him after he got out of the service. We did the Frank Sinatra special, Frank Sinatra show, the only one that Elvis did, with the Jordan Ayers and Bill Black and DJ Fontana and Scotty Scotty Moore. We did that in Miami, and so we had to all take a train from Nashville. Now, why Elvis came to Nashville and picked up the train with us here, I don't know, but that's what happened. Elvis, well, all of his boys came from, Nash from Memphis to Nashville, and we all got on the train here in Nashville and took a train to Miami. That's, I think that, that was the, my, my first and last <laughs> train trip. <clears throat> but uh, I don't know why we didn't fly, but Elvis didn't want to fly. He didn't like to fly, and so we took a train trip. I thought Elvis did a good, good job on the show, and, and, and uh, I, we all enjoyed it. I remember that. Chet not only did uh, did the producing of anything was for RCA that was done here in Nashville, but he also played guitar, rhythm guitar, or electric guitar if it was needed for whomever he was he he was recording. He played uh, guitar for Elvis on, on, on I, I think, I, the sessions at Heartbreak Hotel, for instance. Elvis loved to record at night. You know, he, he, he loved to sleep all day and record at night. And the sessions were called for 6 o'clock usually. But uh, he would show up at 8, maybe 9, and then he would come in the studio and go to the piano. The first, first thing he'd do was speak to each person individually. He'd go around and talk to each, each one of us, speak to each one of us, talk to each one of us. That, other people don't do that. They don't, they don't first of all, you know, t t time is money on sessions, and they didn't want to spend that, that kind of money. We didn't care. We was getting paid by the hour, so it didn't make any difference anyway. But uh, he would talk to each one of us, shake our hand, and say something a little funny to each one of us. But then he'd go over to the piano, sit out at the piano, and he would sing. Now, the, the producers and, and Colonel Parker and what have you, they all many times got so upset because of that, because it was costing RCA money or the, or the movie studio, whomever we were working for. That was costing them money, a lot of money. Elvis didn't care. On one of the uh, on one of the movie sets, I can't remember which one it was, but I remember so well on, on the movie set at the Param at Paramount in, in, in Hollywood. We uh, he came in like that and went over to the piano and started singing, and he wanted us to sing with him. And we sang with him the whole morning. This was during during the when they were doing the soundtrack, and they wanted to do them in the daytime. On the lunch break, the people said, when you come back, don't you sing spirituals with him if that's what he wants to record. So he got back from the lunch break, and the first thing he did was go down to the piano and sit down at the piano and start singing. He called me over there and he said, hey, what's wrong with you guys? He, I said, well, they told us not to sing with you. If you came back in, don't sing spirituals. He said, look, if I want to bring the Jordan out here the whole week and we sit at the piano and sing spirituals, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And he got up and with all of his boys, they trotted out of the studio. And of course the studio, all the men at the Hal Wallace and everybody looked, you know, looked at each other, what could they do? They couldn't do anything. But on Tuesday morning, he came back in the studio and was ready to go and recorded the soundtrack and went right on. Now to get back to the recording sessions here in Nashville, that was pretty much the same way. But in Nashville, he, he would record, he would start maybe recording, we hope, that he would get on the, on the song that he had to do, but he'd play around for, you know, two or three hours. Before. He said he did that to get, because he hadn't been singing, and he would do that to get his voice in shape. And I, and I know it, 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 you, you, you do have to sit down and, and do some stuff to get your, get your voice to singing after you hadn't been singing for a while, and that's what he hadn't been doing. But anyway, uh, 
I remember so well, uh, I did three duets, three or four duets with him. And uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, was, it was really, All Shook Up was my biggest duet I did with him. And that's him slapping on the back of the guitar when he, when he did that. Uh, Crying in the Chapel, we haven't mentioned that one. We did that, we have been playing around for, since six o'clock. He brought that song in about, I guess, midnight, started singing it. Then we stopped and ate a bunch of hamburgers and drank Cokes and what have you. That's what he'd, that's what he'd do. And about three o'clock, he said, let's record Trying in the Chapel. We hadn't done, we hadn't done one, we had not done one song. And here we, <laughs> we were worn out. We'd eat, been eating a bunch of hamburgers. And as Ray said, how can you, how can you do the oohs and ahs on a bunch of hamburgers? But about three, three or three thirty in the morning, we recorded uh, Crying in the Chapel. And that's, that's the way it turned out. And that was <laughs> a big number. And then they couldn't release it after we recorded it because it was, a different publisher had it. Valley Publishers in, in uh, Knoxville owned it, and uh, they wouldn't give the right to Colonel Parker for R R RCA for him to release it. And it was uh, it laid in the can for about, I think four or five years before they recorded it. They bought uh, uh, they bought that publishing company later, and that song was in it, and that's when RCA released it. The fact that Elvis used background voices opened so many doors for the Jordanaires and all the background groups. No one was making a fat living singing oohs and ahs until Elvis came along. He wanted oohs and ahs and so many groups all over the country, as a matter of fact, all over the world started making fat livings just singing oohs and ahs and what have you. So I'll have to give Elvis credit for that. <laughs> 